nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. The uh, title for today's webinar is Novel Two-Dimensional Material and Devices for Biomimetic Sensing and Computing. And uh, that will be uh, by Dr. Saptarshi Dash. And he's assistant professor here at Engineering Science and Mechanics and, uh, and Material Science and Engineering at here at Penn State. He's a colleague of ours uh, within our department here at Penn State. We'll introduce Dr. Doss in a minute. Um, just for your information, this webinar is uh, brought to you courtesy of the NAC Resource Center or the Nanotechnology Applications and Career Knowledge Resource Center. Uh, it's funded by the National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education uh, area. It's a regional center for uh, nanofabrication uh, manu manufacturing engineering. It's a subsidiary of the uh, CNEU uh, at Penn State College of Engineering, Science and Mechanics. So I am uh, Bob Ehrman. I'm the managing director of the uh, NAC Center. Um, I am the co-host for today's webinar. Uh, and our actual, uh, uh, the, my, my other co-host is uh, Dr. Oscar uh, Chakmak. Uh, he's an assistant teaching professor here at Penn State. Uh, Oscar, you want to say hello to folks? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm an assistant teaching professor here at Penn State, and my uh, research is also on nanotechnology, so I'll be one of the co-hosts today for Subtarshi's talk. Hey, Subtarshi, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Bob and Asghar, for inviting me for this uh, uh, NAC webinar. Uh, so I'm Shaptar Shidas. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Engineering, Science and Mechanics here at Penn State. Um, uh, just a little bit of my own background. Uh, I did my uh, uh, undergraduate studies back in India, uh, and then I moved uh, to Purdue University to pursue my uh, doctoral degree. Uh, after completing my doctoral degree, I spent uh, two and a half years in the Argonne National Lab. It's a Department of Energy lab. Um, uh, it's close to Chicago. Uh, and I spent uh, as a postdoctoral researcher over there for two years. And then I was an assistant scientist uh, for uh, six months before I joined Penn State in 2016. Uh, and I've been here uh, uh, since then. So it's been like five years uh, I've been uh, in Penn State. Uh, yeah. Well, we're, we're thrilled to have you, Dr. Das, and uh, we're really looking forward to your, uh, your presentation today, as I'm sure are the uh, folks in the webinar today and the folks who will actually be watching the recordings later on. Okay, great. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so, uh, so today's topic uh, that I'm going to uh, discuss is this novel two-dimensional materials and devices for biomimetic sensing and computing. Uh, so although I will be talking a lot about uh, a new paradigm of sensors, uh, uh, which are inspired by uh, a lot of different animals and how they actually sense their environment for their survival. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to introduce this new class of materials called two-dimensional materials, uh, because all our devices and sensors which uh, we are making are based on these 2D materials. So, uh, now, there has been essentially a revolution in these uh, 2D materials class, and I think uh, many of you may have heard about this wonder material called graphene. It's a single layer of carbon atom arranged in an hexagonal lattice, uh, uh, and this material was uh, uh, discovered uh, back in 2005-2006, uh, and then uh, uh, this made such an impact in the entire field of material science that the Nobel Prize was given within only uh, five years uh, in around 2010. Uh, and beyond graphene, actually, there are also materials which are two-dimensional, like this hexagonal boron nitride. You just simply take the carbon atom and replace them alternatively with boron and nitrogen, and they become uh, boron nitride. And again, a hexagonal structure. But you see that just by changing the atom, you change the property. You go from being a conductor into an insulator. Uh, and this is exactly what uh, Richard Feynman said that, you know, there's a plenty of room in the bottom. So if you start uh, dealing with, you know, changing the position of the atoms and essentially can do atomistic uh, uh, engineering, you can really engineer the properties of the material, which will ultimately determine how your devices and sensors and all the applications emerge. Uh, but what, what we are interested in is mostly semiconductor because all of you, are know, uh, you know about silicon, which is the main driving force of the uh, the semiconductor industry, uh, but there are certain problems which I'm going to articulate uh, very briefly, but uh, there are also 2D materials which would be semiconducting. In fact, if you look into the periodic table, uh, you can find a huge variety of these 2D materials. In fact, they could be numbered almost like 2,000. Uh, 
So while silicon was the champion semiconducting material, now we have an ex entire inventory uh, of this very fascinating uh, two-dimensional material, which are also called transition metal dichalcogenides because they simply take one metal from the transition metal family and one chalcogen atom, which is essentially sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. Now, some, many of these uh, 2D materials can be actually mined, uh, but what is very unique about their structure is that they're layered structure. So they have a very strong uh, bonding in the in-plane direction, but in the out-of-plane direction, there is only weak van der Waals force of attraction. There is no bonding. And this is exactly what allows this material to be exfoliated into very, very thin uh, uh, dimension. Uh, in fact, a single layer of graphene is only 0.3 nanometer thick. Uh, similarly, for MOS3, it's only 0.6 nanometer thick. Now, how, why these 2D materials are becoming very important is that uh, we are kind of uh, hitting a limit with the silicon technology. We know that we have been making our transistors smaller and smaller. So this is simply a transistor structure where you have a silicon channel and you have a source and drain contact through which the current flows. And you have a gate terminal which simply controls this resistance of the channel. And therefore, when the resistance is very high, the transistor is off. When the resistance is very low, the transistor is on. And that is how a digital switch essentially works. But what has been happening over the year is that you are making this silicon smaller and smaller. And in order to do that, you also have to make this silicon thinner. But the problem is, the, even for the current FinFET technology, the silicon is like six nanometer, uh, and therefore it cannot be thinned down anymore. Because once you thin silicon, you get into many different quantum mechanical effects, which are very detrimental for properties. However, these 2D materials can be thinned down to almost an order of magnitude smaller compared to the current silicon technology. And that allows you to simply make the transistors even smaller. And once you have smaller transistor, you can have more of them. Now, the question will naturally arise is that why do we need more transistors? Because more transistors allows us to perform the computation much more uh, uh, efficiently. Uh, and this is what has been happening over the last uh, five decades. You know, computers have been becoming more and more powerful. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, uh, this, uh, the computers that we have today are as powerful as a single mouse brain because we know that the brain can also do a lot of computation uh, and, and the computers can also do computation. But the thing is, uh, brains are much more computational heavy than the computers. So, uh, however, we are on this growth trajectory. Uh, in fact, uh, with the advent of the supercomputers, uh, we can essentially also reach the, the computational power of a human brain. And our target is to essentially keep growing on this, uh, in this path. But there's a problem. The problem is that the supercomputers are enormous. You know, they occupy the size, uh, which is almost equivalent to a football field. Uh, and they also consume huge amount of electricity or power. Uh, so typical power consumption could be in the range of like tens of megawatts. Uh, but if you compare it with the brain, you know, the brain consumes only 20 watts of power. And we all know the size of the human brain. It is just sitting on top uh, of our uh, 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 head, you know. So, so the brain is extremely energy efficient and also area efficient. Um, uh, and therefore, uh, the reason for that is that the way the biological computing takes place is very different from how these computers actually work uh, in, in computers, we typically follow this architecture called von Neumann architecture, where you have the computational unit where all these arithmetic uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication takes place. And then you have another unit, which is called the memory unit, where you store all the data. Now, every time you want to perform some computation, you have to drag that data from the memory, do the computation, and put it back into the memory again. And that actually slows down the process and as well as consumes a lot of energy to shuttle this data from the memory to the logic. However, the brain is very unique. Here, uh, your neurons are essentially your computational units. And the neurons, when they connect with each other, they connect through this uh, chemical uh, synapses. And the synapses are where the information is stored, actually, because the chemical uh, uh, synapses store different weights. So the strength of the connection between the two neurons essentially determines the memory. So the memory and logic, which is different, or separated, physically separated in a computer, are right next to each other uh, in, in, a, in a brain. Uh, uh, and you can see that the number of uh, uh, neurons that uh, adult human brain has got is almost 100 billion. And each neuron connects to almost 1,000 uh, synapses on average. And therefore, there are 100 trillion synapses uh, uh, in a human brain. Uh, uh, compared to that, the modern day computers only have 1 billion transistor compared to 100 trillion synapses that the brain has got. So we are essentially way less in terms of computational power of the brain. 
Now, one more important aspect is that, you know, we think about the human brain to be superior. And it is, in fact, superior when it comes to cognitive computing, when we want to do a lot of computing which is related to, you know, uh, special tasks and, uh, uh, for example, uh, writing a poem or, you know, doing some engineering tasks. Some of us have become doctors and things like that. So those requires a lot of cognitive computing. However, we should be really very humble to look into the animal brains as well. Because this animal brains actually does something which is very important in terms of you know sensory skills, uh, which even the humans cannot uh, accomplish. For example, this octopus has possessed polarized vision. We humans do not have polarized vision. The spiders can actually sense micro vibrations, uh, which humans cannot. These African bush elephants can actually smell water from almost 50 miles of distance. Because in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know you have a very scarcity of water. It's mostly deserted. And in order for the survival, you know, they really need to have amazing sensory skill in order to locate the sources of this water. Similarly, this barn owl can actually hunt in complete darkness, which means that it does not use its vision in order to find its prey. And, and this catfish is an amazing sense of uh, uh, test. In fact, these animals, you know, some of the animals can do things which we humans can't even imagine. For example, the jewel beetles can sense infrared radiation and the bees can sense Earth's magnetic field. Uh, even sharks can sense uh, uh, electric fields. Uh, uh, so the motivation behind what we are trying to do is to essentially capture uh, how these animal brains work because uh, their brains are extremely tiny but they, and, and they also survive on very, very limited resources. So they are extremely energy and area efficient in terms of doing sensory computation. So if we really want to design next generations of sensors, you know, we should be taking our motivation from these animals because evolution over the course of millions of years have essentially uh, made sure that the sensory organs perform in a specific way, in a, uh, in a very, very uh, organized way so that the animals can survive. So let me now give you the first example that we are mimicking. You know, we call it biomimicry because it is essentially mimicking the neurobiological architecture lectures inside these animal banks. So let me give you some examples. The first example is essentially this barn owl. So the barn owl, as I told you, is an amazing, uh, 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 has an amazing sense of localizing sound uh, because it feeds on, let's say, for example, field rats. And these rats simply makes very, very tiny amount of sound, but it can actually locate which direction this sound is coming from. Uh, and it can do it with a precision of one to three degrees, which hu humans, we only have precision of localizing sound at an angle of 20 degrees. So they are uh, way better compared to human. Um, so what we found is that, you know, the auditory information is processed in most of these animals which uh, have evolved. Uh, they have essentially two ears, which are situated on two sides of the body. And whenever a sound is coming at this from a certain direction, there is a time lag between the sound reaching the two ears. And this time lag is essentially used in order to figure out which direction the sound is coming from. But there is a problem because depending upon the size of the head of the object, this time lag could be in the ranges of hundreds of microseconds you know, to one millisecond. However, in brain, we know that the computation takes place using neurons and the neurons can fire only every few milliseconds. So we are trying to process an information which is, has to be processed in hundreds of microseconds using some computational unit which can only operate at millisecond regime. So you can see that auditory information processing is a very challenging task for any animals. Now the animals are very smart. They actually solve this issue by converting this temporal information into a spatial map. Uh, and here is a map that can be found inside the brain of this barn owl. It uses two types of neurons. You know, one neuron is called the coincidence neuron. So this particular neuron, which is marked in red, fires only if it receives the information from the two adjacent neurons, which are called the DELO neurons at the same time. That is why they are called coincidence neuron, right? Now, depending upon which direction the sound is coming from, the sound could reach the right ear first, or the left ear first, and therefore the coincidence will take place at different location. Now, let me give you a uh, you know visual uh, kind of a, uh, tutorial of how this thing is taking place. So here in this particular figure, uh, these uh, these circles, these blue circles, are essentially your coincidence neuron, and these uh, black lines are essentially the uh, the delay neurons. And then you have the two ears on the two sides. Okay. So now let's say, for example, you have a sound coming straight ahead. It will reach both ears at the same time. And therefore, the sound will essentially meet at the middle coincidence neuron. 
However, if the sound comes from the left side, it will reach the left ear first and therefore propagate more to the left neuron and will reach and meet at a position which is somewhere more towards the right, right? And therefore, just by figuring out, you know, which direction, uh, where is the coincidence happening, you can figure out whether the sound came from straight forward or from left or from right, right? So that is essentially what is happening. And this is something we essentially being able to capture in our nanoscale devices. So here we essentially create a similar map that exists inside the burn owl using our 2D material based devices. Um, and you can see that we create these different kind of gaps uh, and these different gaps essentially represent these different coincidence neuron and these different colors lines essentially represents the different delay neurons. So, uh, and just by creating this particular device, which we call the split gate device, I will not go into the technical detail of that. We are able to essentially figure out uh, uh, where the coincidence is taking place. Let's say, for example, if two signals come in the uh, uh, top and uh, vertical, this is vertical lines, blue vertical lines, you can see that the coincidence is going to be given by a certain amplitude. While if the coincidence happens in this yellow line, then it is given by a lesser amplitude and the same happens for the green one. So depending upon the amplitude of the current, we can figure out where did the coincidence took place. And therefore, we can essentially mimic the map that exists inside the burn oil. But you may ask me the question that, okay, you have been able to mimic it, but what's the utilization or advantage of that? The advantage is that the burn oil can essentially have a precision of one to three degrees, as I told you, and humans have a precision of 20 degrees, let's say, for example. But since we can use nanotechnology and we can essentially engineer our devices, we can actually have a precision which is far exceeds the burn oil. We can have a precision of almost like 0 0.001 degree uh, because we can actually make our devices very, very small. Uh, so we kind of learn from the nature and then essentially try to engineer our devices to become better than the nature. Right? So that's the advantage of the biomimicry uh, of making it uh, uh, interesting and better. Uh, for the next generations of uh, sound localization. Now, let me give you another example. The, the next example that I'm going to give you is about uh, this animal called locust. And I think a lot of you already know about locust, uh, but maybe in a negative sense, because these locusts uh, essentially uh, move in swarms. You know, a single swarm of locust could contain one million of them. Uh, and they are known for their wide scale devastation in agricultural fields. I think recently in the last year, they were actually in news in, in Africa, in Caribbean, you know, even in India, Pakistan. Pakistan, they were doing massive destruction of this agricultural field. But there's some interesting aspect to learn from this locust. You know, as I mentioned, you know, there are like millions of locusts which fly together, but they never collide among each other. So they're an amazing collision detector. And if we can learn about their collision avoidance mechanism, we can probably design next generation of autonomous vehicles, drones, uh, which we are essentially uh, going to implement this collision avoidance mechanism. Now, what is even more fascinating about this locust is that in order to avoid the collision, this locust uses a single neuron called this lobular giant movement detector neuron uh, in order to avoid this collision. A single neuron can perform this very complex task. And that is essentially a very interesting discovery. Uh, and because it uses only a single neuron, it is very, very low power. So it is extremely resource uh, 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 efficient. Now, uh, uh, the way the locust actually detect collision is that it takes two uh, input from the visual stimulus. Let's say, for example, this particular line is approaching uh, the locust. Uh, what will happen is that at the line approaches, the angular projection of this line to the locust eye changes, uh, and as well as the angular velocity of this, uh, this line also changes. Now, what the locust does is it uses a neural network, a biological neural network, uh, and it takes the angular velocity of this approaching object and creates an excitatory response in the, in the synapses. Similarly, it takes the angular uh, projection and angular projection also is increasing with time, but the locust uses a fit forward, fit forward uh, inhibition process where it actually converts this uh, angular projection into an inhibitory response. So, so now you can see that one stimuli actually provides an excitatory response and another stimuli, which is theta, provides an inhibitory response. And what this LGMD neuron does is it multiplies these two and it creates a non-monotonic response. And in this non-monotonic response, the firing frequency of the neuron actually picks up right before the collision is going to take place. And therefore, this LGMD neuron 
notifies the motor neuron that it is time for you to change your trajectory and the locus simply avoids the collision. So this is now we try to essentially implement uh, and, and there has been other approaches where people have tried to mimic the uh, you know, vision system in locus, but they were using like 34 transistors and five capacitors and they were pretty big. What we have done, we have, using, we have used a single device, like the locust uses a single neuron. We use a single device, which is based on this 2D material, MOS2. Uh, and you can see that the device is very, very small. Uh, and we use two aspects of this 2D material. One is the fact that this material is very responsive to light. Uh, and that is essentially used to essentially capture this visual stimulus. And then we put it on top of a a uh, very interesting uh, uh, fabricated stack, which actually provides a uh, uh, inhibitory response because it's sitting on a programmable memory stack. Okay, and I will talk a little bit about how how this uh, uh, phenomenon is accomplished. But before we do that, uh, let me give you some kind of a visual experience. So here uh, we are showing a toy car with a LED light on the uh, headlight, and here is the sensor, and you can see that the car comes and collides with the sensor. Now let's see what is the visual stimulus that the sensor is going to essentially experience uh, when a car with a headlight approaches that sensor. You will see that initially the intensity of the light is low and as the car approaches, the headlight essentially creates a very, very intense light uh, uh, stimulus on, on, on the uh, uh, sensor. Uh, so essentially what is happening is that if there are two cars which are on collision course, and let's say for example, one of the cars have this uh, collision detector, uh, uh, when they're far apart, you know, the stimulus that the, the visual stimulus that the sensor sees is very weak. And as the two cars approach each other, you can see that at collision, the intensity of the light is very, very bright. So what happens is that if we uh, simply uh, expose the same kind of stimulus to our device, you know, so here is the device and we essentially expose it to the uh, same visual stimulus. And when we do that, we create a very excited response in our MOS2 devices. You can see that the photo current keeps increasing. This is very similar to the excitatory response that happens in the locus. Uh, however, and, and uh, as well as, you know, if you have an object which is moving faster, it will create, you know, earlier response. But if an object is moving slower or approaching slower, it creates a later response, right? So depending upon the object speed, you can essentially have different response. However, just by the excitatory response, I will not be able to tell when is the collision going to happen, right? Because that is what essentially is needed in order to avoid the collision. And the collision detection should happen before the collision is going to take place so that I have sufficient amount of time to take, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a escape response. So now in order to do that, what we do is we use this backgate uh, voltage you know, and we program the device. When we apply this backgate voltages uh, to our device, what happens is that the device current kind of changes and it actually shows an inhibitory response. So, so now you can see that we have an excitatory response from the visual stimulus and we have an inhibitory response from the programming stimulus. If I combine the two, then I create a response which is non-monotonic in nature, which is very similar to the locust escape response. And you can see that the collision can be detected when the minima is reached, while the collision point is uh, uh, at a later uh, uh, time interval. And now if we do that, you can show that, you know, for any object speed, no matter at what speed the two objects are approaching, my time to collision is always greater than my time to detection. So therefore I am able to detect the collision before it's actually happening. Uh, and this is again motivated by the locus. But the point is, since we have now mimicked the biological circuitry that exists in locus, the energy consumption by the sensor is only in several nanojoules. So it is extremely energy efficient. Yeah. So this is another example of learning from the nature and then implementing it in solid state devices and becoming better. So at this point, I will probably stop and take some questions before continuing on the next uh, section. Uh, my first question while I read this uh, uh, upcoming question, Saptarshi, probably uh, like you've shown, people have tried to replicate these kind of sensors, these kind of devices with the standard silicon technology. Can you compare like, roughly how much of a like a power usage we're like gaining out of this two dimensional materials? Right. So that's an excellent question. Uh, and as I kind of mentioned, you know, people have essentially tried to use uh, filled programmable gate arrays or FPGA chips, uh, which are based on silicon in order to mimic uh, some of these neural circuitry. So, uh, but those were mostly done, you know, back in 70s and 80s. Uh, uh, and then uh, mostly digital computation came in uh, because what I'm showing over here is analog computation. 
uh, and uh, uh, silicon was then abandoned uh, to do analog computation because of the fact that you do not really have a lot of noise margin, which is also going to be the topic of my next discussion. So what happened is that the power consumption uh, were actually uh, almost in the ranges of you know milliwatts uh, to several watts because you were using a lot of circuitry, CMOS based circuitry in order to uh, accomplish the same functionalities. But now, once we have learned a little bit more about these animal brains, and back in 1980s and uh, uh, 90s, there were not the tools available to go inside the brains of these animals and really to understand the neural circuitry. Uh, you know, we were pretty much only mimicking the, the sensory organs. We have never mimicked the brain of these uh, animals because we were never able to go and measure a single neuron. But now we have technologies to essentially go and essentially figure out the neural circuitry inside them. And therefore, there is now the scope for redesign uh, of uh, those things using this novel material, because as I mentioned, you know, silicon is reaching a wall uh, because you cannot scale these devices anymore uh, uh, because of quantum mechanical problems with silicon. And therefore, we are moving on to newer materials in order to essentially resolve that challenge that the silicon is facing. And with those uh, uh, materials, because silicon can never be used as a sensor, you know, silicon is, is an indirect band gap semiconductor. Also, although there are silicon photodiodes, uh, but silicon is not a very good sensor. While these 2D materials are also good sensors. So what are we trying to do is we're trying to combine sensor with computing. And that actually is making the computation very low power. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you do in separate units, the power consumption will be very high. Right, right. So we have to think about, let's say, like silicon's photonic uh, response, like being not a direct band gap. All those things have to be included right. in the discussion, too. So in the meantime, we got uh, nice questions coming up. Let me read the first one from Akbar. Uh, he, he or she, I'm sorry, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, the question is, um, it, it, let's say we now know that the collusion is going to happen. Did you like uh, also research on like the the response time, like how to avoid the, the this uh, collusion? Can you can your device or like the sensor also, uh, in a way, can uh, avoid the collusion timely? Yes, I think that's an excellent question, and uh, I didn't uh, put this thing in in our uh, in this presentation. Actually, we are working on something. This collision avoidance, which we we, we are trying to also avoid collision. You know, one is the collision detection, what the locus does, this LGMD neuron does, and then there's motor neurons, which essentially determines which direction to fly in order to avoid that collision. So a similar system has to be also developed with our sensors, so that it is not the warning system, but also the avoidance system. Now, in order to do that, we are also mimicking another different aspect, uh, and uh, which is also present in, in, in the biology, which is called the central pattern generator. The central pattern generators that are known for our voluntary motions, you know, uh, and essentially from uh, feedback from the environment, you can actually change your motion direction. You know, whenever, whenever, when a horse runs, you know, or when we walk, you know, these central pattern generators are actually uh, uh, walking uh, in the background. So we are actually trying to develop some central pattern generators, which can essentially then, uh, once they're notified, they can avoid the collision because those pattern generators can then direct the, uh, you know, the way, the direction you have to go uh, in order to avoid the collision. So yes, we are working on that. Uh, and as I mentioned, the fact that our devices are based on nanotechnology allows us to perform this computation in a minuscule amount of time. We can get these things done even in like microseconds. Because in neurons, uh, in the brain of the animals, the neurons, as I mentioned, can fire only one every millisecond. So, so for them, they have to wait for the computation to take place uh, 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 for several milliseconds. But with the nanotechnology, uh, we have processors which can work at gigahertz speed, right? So therefore, we can actually uh, detect as well as avoid the collision uh, uh, at a much uh, you know, uh, uh, reasonable time frame uh, before the collision is actually going to happen. Right, so uh, we will continue with the questions uh, at the end. We will have another Q and A session, but just a very short answer, probably. Probably, I, uh, I as I remember, MOS, uh, S2 was a direct band gap semiconductor, right? Yes. Yes. So yeah, we can continue. Right. Right. Okay.
So I think uh, before I start the next section, I also wanted to tell you a little bit because about the fact since we are using these 2D nano devices, I want to give you one slide overview of uh, how we are actually making these devices, right? So these uh, these nano devices, uh, in order to make them, uh, first what we do is we actually grow these 2D materials uh, over like this uh, four inch wafer, let's say for example, and this is done by uh, my colleagues uh, uh, from Penn State, uh, the people who are doing material growth like Professor John Redwing, uh, Professor Josh Robinson. So they essentially use a system called Metal Organic Chemical Vapor Deposition System in order to grow these 2D materials over a large area. Then they hand it over to us. And once we get those materials, we actually use a transfer technique in order to transfer this material from the growth substrate to the device fabrication substrate. And in order, and after we have uh, transferred this material, we actually use a lot of nanofabrication tool. Let's say, for example, an etching tool in order to pattern these 2D materials into you know nice rectangular shapes in order to make these sensors. Then we use e-beam lithography in order to do this patterning. And then finally, we use metal evaporators in order to put these source gen contacts, which ultimately results in these kind of uh, device structure. So here you can see this is the MOS2 over here. Uh, and uh, these are the... Um, uh, the source drain contacts, sorry, I will take there's a pointer. So this is the MOS2 channel. Uh, these are the source drain contacts. And you can see that we can actually design patterns which are as small as 100 nanometer by spacing. So we can make our sensors really very small. We can even go down to 50 nanometer or even 20 nanometer. Uh, for the application that we are looking into, we are currently uh, restricting ourselves to hundreds of nanometer. Uh, so I'm saying that at the background of all these sensors and everything working or the biomimicry, we have a huge effort in making this 2D based nano devices. So, uh, nevertheless, let me move on and let's talk about the final topic, which is uh, uh, stochastic resonance, uh, where I'm going to talk about this constructive role of noise in sensory computation. Uh, now, typically, we all consider noise as a nuisance. You know, we don't like noise. Uh, uh, and it, it is even more important when we are trying to detect signal, right? Signal detection in a conventional approach, you will always want to increase the signal to noise ratio, right? So, and you can do it in two ways. Either you can increase the signal strength so that the signal shows up over the noise flow, or if the signal strength is very weak, then you can try to reduce the noise flow. You see here, the signal strength remain the same. You simply reduce the noise flow and you improve the signal to noise ratio. And this is true not only for electrical engineering, this is true for any field, mechanical, chemical, wherever you want to detect a signal, you always want to improve the signal to noise ratio in order for better detection. Now, uh, and, and we know that you know, over the course of last uh, uh, century or so, we have developed very uh, many different electronic devices like lock-in amplifiers, low noise amplifier, noise filters, uh, specifically in order to remove noise you know, from the signal so that we can detect them better. But the problem is that these components are very hardware intensive. They are very bulky and they're also very energy inefficient. They take a lot of energy in order to minimize this noise. And these are not really appropriate uh, for the sensors which we want to deploy in very remote locations, right? We are now trying to uh, put sensors, let's say, for example, deep inside the ocean, or we want to essentially move, um, monitor the movement of tectonic plates, right? So they will be in remotest of location or in desert, let's say, for example. And in those locations, you do not really have an enormous or un, uh, unrestricted uh, resource of energy. So you really need to figure out a way in order to make sure that you can still detect signal in the, in, uh, under this noisy environment, you know, which are uh, in this remote location or resource constrained location, right? Uh, and this is again very humbling to find that the evolution of animals, uh, you know, there are animals which are actually relies uh, uh, or, or survive in resource constrained environment by, by actually exploiting noise to find their uh, prey or escape from their predators. So here is an example. So uh, uh, there is this paddlefish, and the paddlefish is typically found in Mississippi River in the United States or, or in Yangtze River in China. Now, there's a unique property of these rivers. These rivers are actually very muddy, so their water is very turbid. And therefore, if this paddlefish has to find its prey, it cannot really rely on its vision because you can hardly see anything you know, uh, deep inside those muddy or turbid uh, water. And so this paddlefish feeds on a zooplankton, which is called Daphnia. Uh, and this Daphnia is very interesting. It, when it moves, it actually creates little electrical signals, which are very, very weak in strain. You can see that the signal amplitude is only tens of microvolt. 
uh, and this is even very difficult to detect for even very many modern day electrical sensors. Uh, what this paddlefish has done is it has developed this particular organ, which is called rostrum, which is an electroreceptor. So it can actually receive this electrical signal. Now, this is very interesting that this paddlefish is able to find this daphnia uh, based on this very weak electrical signal. Let's say up to a distance of uh, 50. Okay. Now, the question was, you know, if I add a little bit of electrical noise to the signal of the daphnia, can it find the daphnia, right? Because we know that when we add noise, the signal simply gets, you know, destroyed or kind of becomes even worse for the uh, paddlefish to find that daphnia. Very interesting, it was found that if you do not add any noise, then the paddlefish can find daphnia, let's say up to a distance of 50 meter. If you add too much of noise, then the paddlefish is lost, basically because the signal is lost. It cannot find daphnia at all. However, with the right amount of noise, the paddlefish was able to find daphnia even at a distance of 75 or 100 meters, okay? And these are the essentially the results from that nature paper where they show that with the right amount of noise, the paddlefish is able to find even more distant daphnia, uh, distance daphnia, which means that it can feed better and therefore it can survive better. So here the noise actually aids in the survival of a paddlefish. Now the question was when they did that experiment, this experiment was done in, in a lab. So they can add noise uh, in, into the signal. The question was, does this kind of noise actually exist in nature? In a later paper published by the same group, they found that this noise is actually created by an, uh, a group of daphnia, which are actually always moving together. In fact, the title of the paper is also very interesting. They say that it's a noisy army betrays its outpost. Essentially, this outpost daphnia is trying to survive from the paddle fish, but the army of the daphnia is, by making this noise, is making its survival much more difficult. And this phenomena is called actually the stochastic resonance, uh, which is aiding this paddle fish in order to find its prey. You know, and actually the uh, stochastic resonance can be found in many different species. So uh, it is not only to find the prey, it is also used by many animals to escape from predators. In fact, what is even more fascinating is that it exists in all scales. In fact, the periodic reoccurrence of ice ages uh, is also explained by this stochastic resonance. So it exists in the geographical or geological scales uh, to, you know, even opening and closing of the ion channels inside these neurons or the axons of the neurons uh, inside the brain. So at all scales, stochastic resonance is present. So, uh, now, what is stochastic resonance? In a, in a nutshell, if you have a weak periodic signal, which is below the detection threshold, which is shown by this red line, this signal cannot be detected by any sensor. Okay. Now, if you have white noise and which has all sorts of frequency, then if you add this white noise on top of this periodic signal, then what happens is that periodically or occasionally this signal now crosses the detection threshold. And now if you have a device, which is a thresholding device that can then detect that signal. Okay. So here, what I'm showing is that with right amount of noise, you can actually detect uh, a signal, uh, which is otherwise undetectable. Now let's see if we can implement that in a solid state device. So what we do is we use a photo detector and a LED. So LED is a source of light, a source of signal, and a photo detector is simply a detector. Uh, and our, again, we are using the MOS2 transistor because this MOS2 transistor is photoactive. As I mentioned, it's a direct band gap semiconductor at the monolayer limit, and therefore it is very photoactive and it can detect optical signals. So, now what we did is that first we determine, you know, what is the limit of detection of this MOS2 photo detector. So if I have a very bright intensity of LED, the signal is detected. You can see we have a periodic signal in the LED and the signal is detected by the photo detector, which is very obvious. And as I keep decreasing the LED strength, you know, the signal strength simply goes down because the noise stays the same. And eventually when the LED becomes very faint, I can no longer detect that peak, you know, this peak was here, right? So I can no longer detect that periodic signal. Now the question is, can I detect that signal uh, by adding a little bit of noise? So let me show you some video demonstration. So here, first I'm showing is this weak periodic LED signal. Uh, you can see over here, the weak periodic LED signal and the signal is not being detected by the uh, MOSG photo detector, which is very obvious because the signal strength is very weak. So I cannot detect that signal, obvious. Now let's see that if I simply uh, add some noise, Right, so this is a noisy signal. 
and since it is noise there is no signal present and therefore i cannot detect anything as well only thing that happens over the time is that the noise floor increases noise is signal there is no information over there right so what i have shown you now is that a weak signal by itself cannot be detected a noisy signal there is anyways nothing let's now combine the two and let's see what happens so now i have a weak signal and on top of that i have combined some noise so now it is noise plus signal and now i am able to detect that weak periodic signal so this is essentially a demonstration experimental demonstration of stochastic resonance for the first time in a solid state device it has been observed in biological species but this is the first time we have reported it for a solid state device so the principle is very simple if the led signal is below the detection threshold you cannot detect that signal but once you start adding noise you know if the noise is too small you know there is only a few threshold crossing event and therefore the detector is not being able to pick it up but as you increase the noise there are many threshold crossing event and the signal gets detected but if there is too much of noise then everything crosses the threshold and therefore the signal is again lost so here is essentially the uh, the very uh, you know kind of uh, traditional uh, uh, snr versus noise intensity plot which shows that with without noise i cannot detect that signal with too much of noise i cannot detect that signal but with the right amount of noise i can actually detect that weak periodic signal and again learning from nature we can actually do these things using an energy efficiency which is only in tens of picojoules to nanojoules so it becomes extremely energy efficient in order to detect that signal right so so this is exactly what it is the uh, the stochastic resonance but as i mentioned the stochastic resonance is very generic if we learn from biology we applied it to electrical signal but it could be applied or extended to chemical biological thermal and radiation sensors as well so with this i think uh, what i have been able to convey is the fact that i mean although human brain is very good in cognitive computing when it comes to sensory computation and that too with minimum amount of resources which means that low energy and very small area the animal brains are so much to learn from and that is exactly what we are doing in our group uh, and we call this thing biomimetic computing and sensing So here at the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, all my students, graduate students, and undergraduate students who are working on these uh, different projects. And of course, no research can be done without funding. Uh, so we have funding from NSF, AFOSR, uh, from um, uh, from Army Research Lab, uh, and also from companies like uh, you know Corning and Semiconductor Research Corporation, which has Intel, IBM, these kind of companies. So, uh, so with that, I would like to thank you, and uh, I will take uh, any question that the audience has. Yeah, great, super fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, Subtarsia. And that will leave us some uh, time for interactive Q and A session too. So the first question I will uh, combine Paul's question with mine. So he's asking, like, how do you see the technology developing in general sense? Uh, his main question was about the sensors the Locust was using, but in a way, they're combining that with the owls too, like. Can we use that to sense, let's say, in the future, say, uh, earthquakes, for example? Absolutely. So the idea essentially is to combine, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, the uh, when we design these sensors, you see, we are simply using a single device. Let's say, for example, for collision avoidance, we are using a single device for this auditory information processing, which means that on a single chip, we can actually put all these sensors together. so we can actually integrate these different sensors all on the same chip uh, and and that is something that is very difficult to do with the current technology is because of the fact that we dedicate a lot more devices just to perform a single task uh, and the reason for that is the philosophy of development of these uh, uh, silicon chips is very different the silicon chips are designed for generic purpose tasking you know but these animal brains or the neural networks in animal brains are very very task specific because a certain element simply needs to define their task for their evolutionary success so that they can survive in their environment and therefore they have essentially fine tuned their sensors and the neural network in order to make sure that they can do that particular task the best say so burn owl is not a good collision avoidance uh, they, that, that because collision avoidance is not important for the survival of burn owl similarly the locust is not using its ears you know in order to essentially find or uh, avoid the collisions so they have essentially developed these things and right now what we are trying to do is we are trying to identify all these individual animals which are very good in this specific task so right now the development that we are trying to do is this microelectronics will become much more task specific and that's how we can achieve much better energy efficiency 
instead of having a general purpose processor. I don't know if that answers the question, but I mean, that is essentially the, uh, the mm -hmm. main development. And, and that actually requires you to have these new materials because at the end of the day, we need sensors. And without material properties, we cannot actually accomplish this sensing task. So we need to design these sensors. Uh, and that requires innovation in materials. And that is why we are working on these 2D materials. Fantastic. So I will combine Matt and Akbar's questions together. Matt was asking in the, at the end of the first Q&A, and you talked about it a bit, actually. You were saying that you're going to be working on the pattern recognition, say, for say question for coming from Akbar's, like how many of these uh, multiple excitation sources, like not just one source, but uh, can interfere with your device and like give you good enough time to respond, right? So Matt was also asking, like, did you integrate that any of these sensors in a a drone or a robot, a robot or a toy car, something like that. Right. So right now we have not completely done this uh, integration uh, in, in the in the real uh, uh, applications uh, because this is a technology which is in a very nascent stage of development. Uh, uh, right now we are essentially trying to do the proof of concept demonstrations. So, uh, and once we have made sure that these proof of concept devices actually work in the lab environment, then of course our next idea would be to take it to the next TRL level, right? I mean, uh, at, at this point, we have not integrated these things uh, with the actual car or, you know, for example, uh, with an actual uh, uh, audiomorphic uh, uh, sensing system. But that is our long-term goal. Uh, right now, we are simply exploring different materials and different device structure, different neural architectures. And one thing I did not mention is that we also in our group do a lot of neural networks like this typical artificial neural networks or spiking neural networks, uh, uh, which are going to also do a lot of processing and then learning. Because the, what these uh, sensors are doing is very good in sensing. But just sensing is not going to make our chip smart. We also need to learn from what we sense. Uh, and that component I did not touch in this presentation. And that is something where the cognitive computing that the humans do are actually much more superior, or, or all the primates do, you know, are becoming much more superior. So we also work in that area to design uh, neural networks, which can also learn from the sense data and therefore process and provide feedback to the sensor to, you know, kind of readjust their uh, sensing capability. So because of the limited amount of time, I didn't go into the details of that, but we're also developing sensors which can also learn. Yeah, I think this question is coming from my friend Ahmed, uh, if I'm not mistaken. He's asking, like, is, do you see like an uh, emergence like, or marriage of the, say, more traditional nanomaterials? Probably he means the nanoparticles, quantum dots, those kind of things uh, working hand in hand with uh, these 2D sensors. Absolutely. I think uh, the greatest opportunity comes from the fact that we have this new era of Internet of Things, you know, which has opened up a new opportunity for this no low dimensional materials, whether it is quantum dots or nanowires or nanotubes. Uh, it is very difficult to compete with the silicon technology when it comes to doing, you know, the supercomputers. I don't think that we can build a supercomputers using nanoparticles or these 2D materials. Uh, but what we could do is we could actually develop these IoT sensors, which needs to be, let's say, flexible. They have to be transparent. And these are the properties that the silicon does not offer. So instead of competing with the silicon, I think there is a great opportunity in augmenting what the silicon already offers and providing unique opportunities in the area of this IoT, which is Internet of Things, which is nothing but you know billions and billions of sensors which are going to be connected together. And they have to be smart. You know, they have to learn from their environment because they will be deployed in, you know, deep under the ocean or in forest or in, uh, or in like top of the bridges. I can see the San Francisco bridge, right? I mean, you do not really want your sensors to be, you know, kind of very high power if you are going to deploy them in those remote locations. So, and there I feel these nanomaterials have a unique advantage that the silicon does not provide. And then silicon has its own advantage we cannot ignore. So there has to be a marriage between the two. Right. Uh, the two last questions so far are coming from Matt and uh, Ahmed again. Uh, so when I was also designing many of these analog circuits, when we were boosting the, uh, the gain, for example, we were uh, observing that our noise uh, floor was increasing too. So can we use this kind of an, uh, uh, thing in a way to uh, introduce the noise that you're introducing in your system? Exactly. 
in fact i will tell you that you know i mean uh, noise was always considered bad even in the silicon technology but noise now is a saver in many different applications uh, 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 i will give you one example the one example is that people are not talking about stochastic computing Uh, which is essentially a probabilistic computing and that's a mainstream uh, technology that is getting developed where people use noise in order to do computation very similar to our stochastic resonance that i mentioned uh, uh, and and the fact is that you know let's say for example when when we design these computers the computers when they add let's say for example 1000 plus 1000 they always have to give you the same number 2000 okay but the brain can be all because for the survival even if you make a little bit of mistake if you act to 1000 and say oh it is 1999 it is not going to impact your survival right but this error you know that we create that gives you enormous leverage in terms of energy efficiency right so accurate computing may not always be necessary right, right. when you are measuring your blood pressure you don't need to be like accurate until the six digit right this six sigma accuracy we do not need in many different applications and that can actually save a lot of uh, and that could bring back this analog computing because people did not do analog computing because they say that i will actually have a lot of impact of the noise if i can tolerate noise if i can tolerate error in my system i think we can have a different paradigm of designing these uh, these sensors yeah right so uh when we were talking about the, the last example the deafness is that the right way to pronounce i hope so yeah. what yeah. can we say about the snr improvements say uh with the uh, with this kind of a detection system did, right so i can ever, i can i can probably uh, show you this uh, uh, i can go back SNR meaning, of course, for yeah. when the signal to noise so ratio. See that the yeah. signal to noise ratio, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, they are not very high, but I mean, they are reasonably good enough for the detector to pick it up. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and it will depend upon many different factors, and I, I, I can probably, uh, if someone is interested, I could give you all the details. I mean, if you go into and look into this paper, uh, this paper is an open access paper, so anyone can actually access it. Uh, uh, uh there we give the you know what is the improvement because i think what you are asking about is that whether the improvement is a factor of 2 or factor of 20 right so so those all information um, are essentially yeah, yeah. there and they depend upon many different factors actually so mm-hmm. uh it, it's very difficult to put it into a one uh, single uh, statement uh, but i think detailed analysis uh, could be found in this paper and in fact we are actually writing many different manuscripts on the same topic but we're trying to essentially analyze you know how much is the improvement and the obvious question is of course then just like paul asked do you work closely with the biologists uh interestingly enough i have not yet started working closely with the biology so we read our so there is a because this is a very interesting field in a sense that when biologists write their papers they write in a different uh, uh, way you know what we are looking for is a mathematical information in those biology papers because until and unless we understand the mathematics behind this computation we will not be able to essentially mimic that so i think we need to talk more to the biologist uh, and right now we are talking to few people in the center for neural engineering in in penn state uh, so we are trying to do those collaboration uh, uh but uh, until this point we haven't collaborated a lot with biologists but going forward you know uh we will be essentially collaborating a lot more uh with the biologist uh, uh in order to understand these different neural architectures so uh, uh, but yes i mean we have learned these things from biology papers for sure uh, all this uh-huh. bonnoel locus and all these things we have learned from biology pa- uh, papers uh but we haven't directly collaborated with any biologist uh, 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 immediately but i think that's our plan so we are now be a part of right. this cne center so uh if you have any issues reaching out to these papers please send me an email that's aoc10 at psu.edu and i can uh, let you uh, i can reach out to you and uh, share the papers and the details uh, yes thank you rene one last thing while we're talking about the papers i've seen that you your students have used a lot of these characterization tools to make sure that of course that after the fabrication you need to make sure that the, the device is there and uh, working fine and i've seen that you used uh, atomic force microscopy xrd 
those kind of things. So it's probably like important to emphasize that we have this, uh, a lot of the folks attending today already know, but uh, we have this network of remotely accessible uh, instruments, nanotechnology instruments, and we have a lot of atomic force microscopes there. We're trying to incorporate XRDs and other, say, XPS, uh, those kind of tools too. So your students can uh, also interact with these tools as well. Not at the level, of course, that Subtarshi students are doing at the research level, but at least proof of principle uh, scans and imaging can be done with the tools that we have in our network. So great, thank you very much, Subtarshi, for this great presentation, fascinating presentation. Thanks again for attending. Thank you. Thank you.